How to Come Out of Your Head and Into Your Body with Claire Maxwell. Hey, everybody. I have a great guest for us today to teach us and give us some tips on how to come out of our overly developed intellects and into our bodies. It's so important. Claire Maxwell has a long list of amazing accomplishments and things that she does to help people come into their body. So check the show notes and you will see her full bio and links and ways to follow her. In fact, I, I stalk her on YouTube and LinkedIn <laughs> be, because what I know about Claire from the years I've known her is that she freely offers really great wisdom along with real tangible results. So Claire, welcome to the show. I, uh, I have all kinds of things I want to talk to you about today. <laughs> super thrilled, super thrilled to actually have the time to really talk to you, you know, it's great. Yes. Oh, yeah. This is going to be so good. And, and one of the things I want to start off talking about is give everyone and probably me also too, an idea of what drew you to the work in working with embodiment and the Alexander technique and all these things. What drew you into this arena of your profession? How did you get there? Well, like most of the really uh, amazing and fun stuff in life, it was kind of accidental. You know, Cir circumstances guided me towards dance when I was a young kid. My parents were folk dancers and my mother used to take me to see these shows at we, we I grew up in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So at the university, they had the most amazing programming. We're talking in the late 60s and early 70s, when modern American modern dance was just exploding. So much innovation, so many new ways of looking at, at the world and at the theatrical space. And so, and my brother took modern dance classes and I wanted to be like my big brother. So I went to those classes. And one day we used to go to the public park and there was this class in the public park that was totally free. You could do tap dance, but then you could do this other thing called idiokinesis. Have you ever heard of idiokinesis? I've never heard of it. Tell us what idiokinesis is. It's so cool. It was created by this woman named Martha Clark and Mabel Todd. And what they did was they started to think about what was the con connection between their imagination and their body. And so it, it's very unusual to encounter this when you're young. Most dance classes, you're just learning steps or, you know, and it's fun and you move. But this class, I went in there and the lady's wearing like a black leotard, you know, and she said, lie down on the floor and I want you to close your eyes. And if anybody's listening, you can try this even just if where you're sitting. Except and if you're if you're driving, don't close your eyes. Don't close your eyes. <laughs> you could probably do this while you were driving if you were practiced, but you have to practice a little first. So you think about your shoulder blades where they live in your back. I still remember this. Mm -hmm. This is like 45 years ago. So you imagine them as sponges. You got that? You can do that, right? Yeah, Anybody I'm can do imagining, that. I'm imagining them in my shoulder blades in the back as sponges. Yeah, okay. they're I'm sponges. And then the sponges fill up with water. And they start to slide and move. And become softer and more fluid. And maybe a little heavier. And they start to slide around on your ribs. I still remember that image 40 years later. Wow. So they created a whole, it was called experiential anatomy. So they were taking the actual structures of the body and you would study them and look at pictures, but then you would bring in imagery and imagination and poetry. And you would start to put the way you were thinking and the qualities of your thought with the parts of your body. Oh, that's excellent. It's so cool. Mm -hmm. And I loved it, but I can tell you more what happened because I thought that's what dance would be, and it wasn't. <laughs> no, that's not what dance is at all. <laughs> 
And so how did you end up doing all of these really amazing movement body oriented things in your professional world? How did it go from this really fun, curious, I want to do that to there's meaning here beyond just fun? Well, yeah. So I still remember in that class when I was, you know, maybe 10, that some part of me said, I want to make something like this. And then that tucked away and and was quiet for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And in the course of my dance career, I was very ambitious and very driven. And I shredded my body pretty much completely by the time I was about 26, which is just when your career is supposed to be starting, you know? So I encountered at that point, I was not looking for help because I thought it was good to shred your body. I I was proud of my injuries. I was proud to be driven. And I had no idea how headed for disaster I was. And just by accident, I, I took this dance class that was taught by a brilliant teacher by the name of Eva Karsag. She's Hungarian. And it was Alexander Technique based. It was nonverbal. It's nonverbal intelligence. Okay. So it's, it's not difficult to accept that we have nonverbal intelligence. For instance, we don't talk, right, for the first three years of our life, and that's when our brains are the most active. So there has to be something that's not just verbal and cognitive. So she puts her hand on my body, and behind the touch, there's all of this intelligence. Mm-hmm. And I just dropped into this open state and ease that was amazing. I was dancing with a group of 20 people. I could feel and sense all of them at once. And I was working like 80% less in my musculature. Mm. And I was like, what just happened? That makes any sense to you. Oh, yes. Instant. It was instant. And so then anybody with any emotional and intellectual overexcitability has to go down that rabbit hole and sort out what that's all about and turn it into something and make it a thing because that's what gifted people do. That's exactly what I did. (laughs) (laughs) Of course you did. Oh my God, you get me, right? That's that's really funny. That's so funny. Yeah. So it, it, so that's what happened. And in the process of doing that, it, 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 that this beautiful, technique. I said, what are you doing, Eva? And she said, oh, it's the Alexander work. So I said, okay, it took me 15 years to get my training because it was very expensive and I had to have my career, but it saved my body. So, you know, I started to learn it for myself. Great. And then in the end, I was like, I, there's nothing else I really want to share with people. This is it. So I went and got my training. And of course, like training often does, the training just completely killed the butterfly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, it took me 10 years after my training to kind of rediscover my innocence. And I had to throw away a lot of what the standards that were set up in the profession. They're very high. It's very intense training. And so what I was seeing was a lot of people that were very alive in our work, but kind of stiff. And I wanted to bring together what I knew was possible from dancing with this mindful quality or, you know, bringing the intellect and the body together and watching them, you know, make magic, which I remembered was possible. And I had many, many moments of grace in my dance career. So I knew it was possible. But what I had to do to create my own body of work was let go of the label. Okay, so you bring up an interesting point, and uh, <laughs> I hope that wasn't too much of a no. Woo! No, this is this is very no. It's not too far at all. So I notice with a lot of gifted people, and a, and a lot of people in general, mm-hmm. that the stiffness mm-hmm. of our body. I mean, I feel it in me sometimes too. I mean, and I'm an athlete, and mm-hmm. I can feel sometimes like. A stiffness that is not conscious. That's just in there. Yes. And I know that most gifted people and intelligent people tend to live in their head. 
you know, and I make the joke about, you know, we're not brains walking around on sticks. There's actually bodies that go with the brains and, and those kinds of things. And like, how are we going to integrate all those things? So my other, uh, what goes with that too, that I know is that it takes about 60 to 70%, if not higher, maybe closer to 80% of our own healing of our own being is nonverbal, mm-hmm. which, so talk therapy alone and talk things only only take care of about 20 or 30%. And so then what are we going to do for the rest to bring that synergy together so that it's a yes and it's talking and it's movement and it's music and it's fill in the blanks, all these different things. Mm -hmm. So speak a little bit to the stiffness part. Like how do people get so stiff and what would be something that because probably everybody listening is thinking, well, I I got that stiffness. Sign me up, you know, even if we're not aware of it, Mm-hmm. What's a good mm-hmm. first step to start saying, hold on a second, there's more. You don't have to be stuck in this rigid spot. Well, I think at first it's helpful to understand what might be the source mm-hmm. of the stiffness. And because this stuff, this reality we're talking about right. is consciousness. That is pre-verbal or non-verbal. It's not just pre-verbal, it's non-verbal. Okay. So when we use words to talk about it, like if I use the word foot right now with you, it's pretty natural that your mind will go to your foot. Right. And you can you can feel your foot mm-hmm. while you're looking into the camera and talking to me. And this is actually something you can do. While you're thinking and talking. Mm -hmm. So it's happening simultaneously all the time. It's just that you're not enjoying it as much as you could be. Cool. Okay. (laughs) So, So how does somebody start enjoying being in their body? Well, so part of, yeah. So is there any part of your body that feels good right now? That feels good right now. Yeah. Yeah, Right now, my shoulders feel good. Like this part of my body feels good. And my like where my waist is like, I feel like I'm going like this, like this part feels really good. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the best way in. So go to where what feels good. Go to what feels good. And go in that way. Go in that way and get curious about it. Oh, I love curiosity. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, and what would it be like if, uh, to me, movement is very helpful to wake the body up because when you move your foot or you move your waist, it produces a sort of a a wash of sensation. And that feeds your brain. And the way it feeds your brain is literally your brain has maps of your body in it, right? It has sensory maps and it has motor maps. So the simplicity of moving to bring, literally what happens is blood goes to your sensory map when you move. Like it, it, it wakes up. If you, you're touching your arms right now, mm-hmm. so you're already doing that. If you just feel your hands, this, the soft skin of your palms touching your arms, and then you realize, hey, my arms are touching my hands too. Right. There's a back and forth. Ooh, it's soft and there's warmth and there's touch. So the simplicity of contact literally brings blood and nutri- nutrients to the area of the brain that's for the body. And so that, this is a little bit off topic, but... I want to make sure that that I I'm, that I'm making this leap properly. <laughs> uh, what you're just saying is like, okay, well, that, so there's the gravity of isolation because of COVID, I, isolation because we can't have touch with others or have that. And then if people aren't taught and encouraged to make friends with their own being, and so they don't have that touch either, their that, physical being, right, right, their then, physical being, then that could totally impair their life experience. It's literally going to cause depression. When what happens when the the sensory map 
is deprived of attention is that your sense of yourself shrinks. Your sense of your being shrinks. And literally less blood is also going to the part of the body. So there's a conversation between the organ of the brain right. and the part of the body or the whole body. So there's, there is, they're not really separate. <laughs> no, but we, no. T- we talk about them as separate because there's a, co- a, some kind of conversation between this organ that is our brain and our body, but it's actually impossible to be disembodied. So what tightness is, is the shrinking of the body map, the, the withdrawal of the awareness from the body map, the consciousness from the body map. And so we have to invite it back with, with kindness, right? And there's a trick here, there's a problem. Because our nervous system, as I know you are familiar with, Mm -hmm. is primed to alert us to problems. Yes. So what we have is this ground of okayness, sort of, and then the problem sticks out. And that's where our attention goes. So you have to use your intelligence. And this is the first skill I teach people whenever I work with them, especially online, is to use that beautiful consciousness, loving consciousness, spiritual consciousness, whatever you want to call it, right. to, to look for where the ease is, where the comfort is, because comfort is expansive, ease is expansive. And that is go- whatever you focus your attention on gets amplified. Correct. You get That's more, the power of your mind. Right. Because the reticulator activating system finds more of it and it gets bigger. And that's the point. So when you focus on pain, you get more pain. When you focus on restriction, you get more restriction. And then there's all, for me, it's a reciprocity, you know, like, you know, a lot of people do talk about it is the exchange, but I think it's like all one energy. That's just fluid. That, that's how I experience the consciousness. And, and I work with my people that way. And I think it's so important because I see people, I have clients every day that are so in their head that when I say, how are you feeling? They say good or fine. And then I say, well, if good or fine, we're feeling word. How would that feel? Because those aren't the answers. (laughs) And um, and so now when they hear me ask somebody else, they start laughing like, oh, she's going to get them. And I'm like, well, I'm not trying to get them. I'm just trying to say, let's breathe into who we really are and let ourselves like be okay being that whatever our beingness is, all of it, the consciousness on all the planes. Yes, because I feel the the other truth about our consciousness is that it can travel way beyond the limits of our physical body. We know that, right? So it can travel there. And I would never, sometimes I was told that I was too mental to be a dancer, which is just (laughs) ridiculous. You know, and I I think what they saw, though, was the number of connections and things that were happening in my mind. They could see your intellectual overexcitability and they they, they said intellectual people can't dance or don't dance. Yes, they just that's that's not they should be stupid. And it's really not true. It's really not true. It's just that somehow this Alexander work helped me open up the connection between that outside, like, you know, the associations and all the different things that I've known and seen and been in touch with in life. And then I could bring it in and find and uh, send it to my foot, you know, or, and I think that in terms of our bodies, the unfortunate thing, I was thinking about this a lot about gifted people. Tell me if this is true or not for you, if this has been true for you. You try, you're trying to get into your body. You're looking for some way to get into your body. And I'm not putting any of these things down because they're all great. But you end up with something like Pilates or, uh, you know, something like Zumba. And it's like there's a culture around it and everybody looks a certain way and or even a healing modality like trauma work. Mm-hmm. And they're going into your body and they have a goal in mind. They want to heal something or fix something or improve a muscle or something like that improve strength. All of those things are great. But they're so much better if you have in place this imaginative conversation, pleasurable conversation with your own body. 
And everybody has, I've never met anybody that doesn't have it. Ever. Right. And it, it's a yes. And it's like, you know, somebody Thank asked you. me, somebody asked me one time, like how many different healing modalities have you tried to me? <laughs> and I stopped at like 55 and that was a couple of years ago. And I've tried more since then. So I don't know, hundred, we'll say a hundred for a good number. It's probably more than that even I, because I believe that as long as it's, it's, you know, something that's valid and safe, and I've done my due diligence with my discernment, that our bodies are so multidimensional and so multifaceted that all of our being with our consciousness, our physical form, our spiritual form, our mental, intellectual, all, the, all of us requires a yes and with all different kinds of things. And they come together for the good of the whole. So when somebody says, well, I'm only going to do certain nutrition, but I'm not going to exercise, we call that thin fat. That they might look thin, but they're really not healthy, right? Mm. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they're not taking care of themselves in that way. And then other people who might look another way, you know, there's all these different combinations. So I have a big one on trying just about everything I can mm. uh, for my own experience of it. And when I've run rehab centers over the years, if anybody wanted to bring any kind of modality to my clients, and still this is true today, I mm -hmm. try it first. Like I'm the guinea pig if... If I can resonate and understand and see how it fits into their reality, then I'll say, go try it. But if I can't sort it out, how do I expect a beginner to sort it out? Because mm -hmm. I've been doing this a long time. And so that's why I wanted to have you on the show, because being in our body is critical to our health and welfare and wellness, period. Our survival, like our thriving survival. Mm -hmm. And it is typically underrepresented in the gifted world as how important it really is. So if everybody who is leads with their head is always trying to figure it out, my comment always is, what if it's not figure outable? What if figuring is not the answer? What if the answer is breathing in and making friends with who we are on all these different levels and then emerging through that space? And that seems very similar to what you're talking about. Yes, it is. And so if I'm using embodiment prompts, I like to use concrete parts of the body. And right now, for the last five years, I've been really interested in the nervous system. And I think the side benefit is that everybody can benefit from understanding their nervous system a little bit. But the prompts that I give, for instance, just to notice the air coming in through your nose and to know that there's actually a sense organ about an inch. What is this called? The third eye? Mm -hmm. The third eye. So it's, it's about an inch behind that. And you can feel there's a space between your eyes. And if you, if you actually feel, you, you take a moment, you have to stop. You can feel the sensation of the air coming into that space. It's cool mm -hmm. on the way in and it's, it's warmer on the way out. I can't even remember now why I said this, but that's okay. I was just trying to give a demonstration of how it's helpful to have a concrete part of the body, right? So for me, sometimes just sense your body is too vague. It's too vague. Yes. We are, especially brains that are like, give me something to chew on. They, they need something to chew on, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So give your brain itself. Like basically, if you're interested in the nervous system, it's the brain mm -hmm. kind of going, oh, what am I? You know, like, oh, I'm a brain and a brain stem and a spinal cord. Cool. You know, and if the person's interested in that, if it's if it's waking them up, then I can say, so are you stiffening your spinal cord? Maybe you don't need to do that. And I can start to give them some tools, which I would call constructive thinking. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Constructive. How do we know it's constructive? Well, you just told me that you use your own self, which is an embodied self, mm -hmm. as a bellwether to see whether something's constructive or not, right? Right. Yes, often. Yes. But we assume that people know how to do that. And as I've said, I, everybody 
once you point out that they know how to do it, they realize they know how to do it. But a lot of times they're not conscious that they know how to do it. Oh, yeah. Or it could be, especially if they're so sensitive and they've gotten so overwhelmed with the sensory information that they shut it down. Like, like what's normal for some people will be painful for a highly sensitive person. Who would want to feel pain? Nobody wants to feel pain. So you just shut it down. But then when you shut it down, you're shutting down your core compass. So and that's important. I, I, I is that when you shut yourself down, let, replay this, everybody, when you shut yourself down, then yeah. you are shutting down your core compass, the way that your moral compass can guide you through life. So yes, we can shut ourselves down when we're in a situation temporarily where we need to, obviously. And go right in, ahead, please. You know? Staying in a place <laughs> of being chronically shut down or chronically overwhelmed, which is a form of shutdown, is dangerous for your welfare. So it's time that we all start being open-minded and wake up a little bit to ways where we can begin to be friendly with our bodies and our consciousness and our being so that we can be who we're meant to be. You mentioned that this is so important because if we don't hear what our body is telling us, then we end up not being safe. Mm -hmm. And then that reinforces fear and isolation. And then we go further. So there are ways, you know, when you work with an individual person, I'm sure that you do this very skillfully, is you realize you've got to create the right kind of container for the sensitivity so that they can start to let some of it in. And so a lot of the work is noticing what gets the person to be blunt, jacked up and saying to them, okay, I'm noticing this is what's getting you jacked up. So let's take that away and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So in Alexander Technique, we call that, we work with stimulus and response. And we wanna get a person to the place where they're not in emergency mode, so that they can actually get curious about stimulus and response. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that even comes when you bring your consciousness to your body. So sometimes when you say to somebody, be aware of your heart mm -hmm. or something like that, they go, right. Ugh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Ugh, I don't want to feel that. Like there's a negative, they have a negative relationship to it, right? So you have to, you have to find the way in and it's just not the same for everybody. Well, it's interesting because I, uh, I have several clients I'm working with right now and, and I'm having all of a sudden these flashbacks. In the last week, I have heard, my brain is encapsulated in a welded metal thing and nothing wants to get in, even though I want things to get in my brain. I, and then another person, I have is this metal welded box in my gut and I can't, I can't let my, my stomach can't feel anything. And a lot of the gifted people I work with, when I go, we go start going into like, what's their inner landscape looking like? There is almost always something that they describe it as metal and welded and hard and um, sealed up. Like there's, there's no obvious way in. So it's so tightly encapsulated. And so I begin to help work with them on softening that and how there's, there's going to be a way in. We'll find a way in, you know, those people who wrap gifts where they put so much tape on it that it seems like there's no way in, but you can find, like, in. <laughs> yeah. find a way in eventually. That's my sister-in-law does that. So, okay. And, and that's the same thing. So there's more than one way in and often the way in is nonverbal. Yes. It's very mysterious, but there again, if you've got a welted shut box, in your body and you bring your bra your brain your your consciousness to it where my work would come in would be what is the quality of the consciousness yes. and the and the curiosity right so we're not going to try to open it we're not going to try to change it we're just like oh well, what is this like and can i bring some softness to it right and that's a different approach than taking a sledgehammer and trying to bang into it and re-traumatizing the person in the situation or, or potentially causing a big mess. Rather, you know, that's, yes. that other approach was big in the 80s and that did a lot of damage. I think it's really important. Oh, my goodness. And I think it's really important to realize in, 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 that, you know, any 
any hardened space in any of us, whether it's big or little, or we can name it or not, that the antidote, the way to help ourselves is to bring softness and kindness and compassion and gentleness and allow things to breathe into a softer space versus attacking and being very forceful. Would you say that that's kind of true? Yes, because it, you know, of course, and, and actually even with body tissue, this is a thing for me. Because if you've got a muscle that's like this and you poke it or you push it, it's just going to, it can cause damage. It'll fight back. It'll fight It'll back. fight back. But just similar to you touching your own body, if you bring a hand to that place and you, it's, we call it a listening hand. So back in the days when we were working in person and using touch as a communicative tool. Right. So you, you bring that listening hand and something happens. You're just through being perceived. Just through being, we call, it's called awareness of something. And so awareness of something, the curiosity, mm-hmm. without trying to do something, which is an activity in the nervous system. Alexander himself was a person and he noticed that if he could do something, he could also not do it. Mm-hmm. And he got really curious about that sense of agency in his nervous system. He called it inhibition, but it's kind of a weird word. Um, Non-doing is another word that can be very vague and zen and nobody really knows what it means. But, you know, if you press your hand down into your legs right now, that's a doing. And you can also then undo that. Correct. Yeah. And that's an activity in the nervous system. So that can really help people get in touch with their bodies because it's not one is bad. It's just you've got both sides of your nervous system, the side that acts and the side doesn't act, I guess, right? doesn't activate. So there's intense activation and sensitivities. Mm -hmm. And then you have a little bit of a little bit of control, you know. With that beautiful consciousness. And the, that's key because it's not a lot of work. It's a little light touch. And the consciousness is so important, especially for people who are over, overly intellectualized and reinforced for it. Part of that typically is a shutdown in that higher consciousness. And so it takes softening that too so that So that the whole being can then be within the physical body, but also the consciousness can continue to expand because we're meant to always expand in unity, diversity, and complexity. That's what we're designed to do. So when we shut it down and we're fighting the laws of the universe, the universe is going to win and we're going to end up not feeling so hot in some way, shape, or form. Tell me a little bit about that when consciousness shuts down, like what's that like? Well, for I, I think it's different for everybody, but I think it creates a, a, a rigid darkness within and like a walls up and mm-hmm. gets rid of curiosity, gets rid of and kind of runs interference on connection. And we start seeing all kinds of other overthinking sometimes, procrastination. But it's also like um, mm. I have some people who experience it as like a, a conspicuous absence, like a void that there's nothing there, even though there probably is something there. It's just like dark. And even in the darkness, there's things, but yet they can't connect to them. And Mm. I think it's important that we, we practice waking up on these deeper levels because I believe that the multi-potentialite possibility for people and our multi-dimensions are required in this day and age to bring humanity into um, a much healthier way of living. Well, that's really, that's really the problem now today, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Is what, how, what other options do we have other than withdrawal? Yeah, you, you, yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. And how do you do and And not only what other option we have, but how do we do it? Like what, now what? And what's my role in it or not? You know, there's so, there's so many questions. Um, so what do you do for fun? 
because you know mm-hmm. like all of us who work with people in an intimate way even though you're, we're doing stuff so much stuff on zoom we're still connected in deep ways with people and and you're really present to do a lot of really great work and so what do you do to like burn off that energy and have a little fun and kick up your heels kind of thing what do you like to do I have to get out of the house for one thing. I have to get out of these four walls. We're just, we're in inside so much. So just to go outside and I live in this big building. So I've got like 110 families living around me and they're amazing people. This is like the UN. There are people from all over the world in this building because this is Brooklyn. We call it the People's Republic of Brooklyn. <laughs> and so... When I have a new neighbor, I like to go meet them and exchange food. My next door neighbor uh, makes the most amazing baklava. She's from Lebanon. I've got another friend from the Philippines that just moved in. And I like to go out for walks. And and, um, when we can get away, we really like to hike. We really like to get out. Um, But they're kind of, uh, I hate the kind of hiking, you know, where you are trying to get somewhere or walk a certain amount of miles or something like that. So it's just to get lost in a place to kind of yeah wander, you know, be part of the scenery, be part of it all. Yeah. I'm kind of a people person. I like yes. to forget myself and, and, you know, I'm the opposite of a misanthrope. I do need to rest, but, but I, I get, I need a break from my own brain. I just, you know, I would like to talk to people. So what food do you take to the neighbors? Uh, well, I'm not that good a cook, but uh, <laughs> I make my girlfriend cook, uh, cook the cookies. She makes really good chocolate chip cookies. That's oh. what we eat. Simple. Yeah. I'm just simple. But that's a good, that's a good welcome present. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm not particularly skilled in that area. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. So what is the most memorable food you've ever eaten? Well, yeah, this might seem odd. Uh, but this is easy for me. Potato skins with butter. Ooh, that sounds good. You know, I remember the first time I ate potato skins with butter. You know, like a roasted potato. Mm-hmm. Somebody else ate the middle. It's mm-hmm. so warm. You put some butter in there. It's the taste of the skin, the crispy potato skin. Yeah. I love that. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I know I ask all these crazy questions. So I have a couple other questions, but before I ask those, you've already helped us so much with so many different things. Is there anything that you wanted to share today that I didn't ask you about? Actually, no, I think you were really thorough. I I actually did a little bit of writing and I have sort of a list here of things that came up in response to your work and some of the things that your podcast guests were saying. I guess I wanted to sort of um, make a plug for, you know, I think that our, our brain gets a bad rap and it's able, you know, we have unique brains. They look for patterns. They do things that other mammals' brains don't do. And I think that's a little bit of a burden for us to be walking around with this pattern-seeking embodied highly sensitive intelligence because when difficult things happen our brain remembers that and it's always looking for that pattern you know so there's a there's a beautiful side to that and then there's a difficulty to it and i i kind of feel like it gets just if people could let go of the of any blaming of themselves for mm-hmm. this if if that's a thing uh, it's a thing that I did. It's, it's a thing for a lot of people. And in the gift world, you know? we will always say that one time is a habit. That our, the <laughs> learning curve is so high, you only have to do it once. And now we have a habit formed. It's, and habit is so powerful. Yes. So let's just have a little sense of humor about it and laugh about it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and remember that your body is, can be an ally in undoing some of these because if you check that compass and your body says i'm feeling really tight right now that's important to notice because whatever it is that you're quote as if you could do anything but embodied thinking whatever it is that you are thinking 
your body is carrying out to the best of its ability all the time. So if you are thinking 8 million things, your body is doing 8 million things, and that's why it's gotten stiff. Because it's carrying out the activity of your mind. There is no separation. And so you've got to change what you're thinking, and then you will get feedback from your body. So there's a feedback loop. And if you notice that you feel better all of a sudden, get curious. What was I just thinking? Mm -hmm. What was it that I just did that I'm having this positive response to? Let me do that again. Right. But you do have to check the compass. And it's a little bit of a skill, but I'm sure you're teaching that all the time. It's so beautiful, really, really beautiful work. Thank yes. you so much. Oh, yes. I love it. I love what I do. And, mm. and I love what you're bringing to the table. And so if you're loving what Claire is saying, like you, like I am, then go to the show notes and start stalking her like I do on social media. Um, <laughs> she does really, really great videos and really, really amazing things that you can follow along and learn from her. I am. Um, I've been doing it for a while now, but she already knows I'm stalking her on LinkedIn and, and YouTube and all that, but it's because there's great value. So if you're enjoying it, let her know you heard her on the show so that uh, she will know how you found her. So I have one last question for you. That's my favorite question, actually. And that is that we're going to put a big billboard up that the whole world is going to see with Claire Maxwell's quote on it. What is that quote going to be that you want the whole world to see? Oh, God, I don't have one. <laughs> I don't have one. I really don't. Oh, I'm not a normal it? person. Have more pleasure and less. More pleasure, more curiosity, less analysis. A a anal analysis. Okay. Yeah. More, more, more pleasure, pleasure. More, more curiosity. Yeah. More curiosity. Less analysis. Very good. Perfect. See, you do have a quote that's for the whole world to see. <laughs> Aha! Oh, you tricked I love me. It. You're uh, so good you. at it. Well, I, I love that question because I, I know that each of us, our soul, our heart has a purpose and a mission. And we're here on purpose with a purpose. I know that. And so when we are willing to put it on a billboard, like this is what it's about. And we have our agency and our sovereignty in that. We're now empowered to make the changes and grow and evolve in the ways that we're meant to do it, however that's supposed to look. So there you go. That's the perfect billboard. I'm collecting billboards all over the place from just about everybody. And we have some really good quotes. And now I have yours. Thank you so much. Could you imagine if you were like driving down a road and you saw those billboards? That's a movie. You have to make a movie, Diane. Oh, that, that would be perfect. I'll have to get my assistance on that right away. That's a good <laughs> Okay, everybody. Well, thank you very much for listening to us today. And remember, put your face to the sun so the shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star and you're here on purpose with a purpose. So go out there, have some fun, be curious, and allow yourself to move with ease and grace and poise through your life so that you can be that mighty presence you're meant to be. Thank you, Claire, for being on the show. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Till the next thank time. Thank you so much. Be well.